everyone. My name is Jesse Chason with Lisa Blanchard as the host of Airing Addiction. I share often my journey started on this campus. Got sober as a client here, just like you. I really do see phenomenal change. Always hope. I've seen situations that on the surface look impossible become possible. Doing this podcast is to share those recovery stories, be honest about what the challenges are and have some real conversations, but kind of share that out on the the airwaves. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another exciting episode of Airing Addiction. My name is Jesse Chason. I'll be one of your co-hosts today, along with Lisa Blanchard. Good morning, Lisa. Good morning, Jesse. Thanks so much for kicking us off today on this uh, date. We're airing this on 2-22-22. It sounds like such a cool date to do such a great, uh, great podcast and episode today. Um, so I really want to um, start us off by really recognizing um, our guest today, Maureen Kavanaugh. This is a second time um, th- that we have had her here on the podcast. Um, and there's about a million and one reasons why we invited her back. Um, but the biggest of which is that that, um, you know, that podcast really um, created some significant shifts for me, right? And um, I've been doing this for a long time. I actually just shared with the group that today is my 23rd anniversary at Spectrum. But just hearing directly from Maureen and her perspective has really changed um, my own practice and therefore Spectrum and New England Recovery Center's practice really forever. And so um, I just can't um, thank Maureen enough, but I want to um, turn it over to Maureen and introduce her. And if for those of you who don't know you, right, who don't know your work at Magnolia, have not read your book. Would you mind giving us just a, you know, a a brief kind of like review? Sure. Um, You know, it's funny because um, I, um, I tell the story a lot and it, every time I tell it, you would think it would get old and it does, you know, to a certain extent as as anybody tells a story about something that happened to them over and over again. But um, I get to certain parts of the story and I still get choked up because it was such a painful part of my life and um, changed, you know, changed my life, changed my family's life. When my daughter, who is the third of four, um, became involved with um, with uh, drugs and then eventually heroin. And um, we uh, coming from a family like I like I did. Um, full of alcohol and drugs. I swore no one, this would never happen to me, right? I, I should have those words tattooed on myself somewhere. This will never happen to me because I did everything I could, right? So I did all of the things. I read all the books. I had all the family dinners. We went on the family vacations. Um, I did everything I could to make sure I thought that this was never going to happen, including moving away from my from my family that was uh, still, you know, struggling or had struggled and fresh start. Everything is going to be great. And, um, it, you know, it worked to a certain degree. It was it was helpful to, you know, I think three of my four kids that we were so on top of everything. But you know, there's a genetic predisposition for some of this. And my daughter, when she started to experiment, got sucked in almost immediately and um, it progressed. And by the time she had come to me, she was in her first year of college and came home and said that she had tried, you know, um, she had been using, definitely drinking too much and she had tried heroin and she was scared. So yeah, she was scared. I was uh, talking about scared. I've never been so scared in my whole life. And um, brought her to um, the emergency room because I didn't know what else to do. And you would think after growing up, like, you know, in the middle of all this, that I would have some knowledge of what to do. But we don't know what to do when it's our own child. And, you know, when it's our own loved one, it's like everything, everything is different. And I know that from working with people that are even in this field, when it's their own kid. They, the wheels kind of come off the bus. They don't know what to do. So um, that started a really long, arduous, difficult uh, journey with my daughter that resulted in the book, If You Love Me. And, um, you know, long story short is I did all of the things that I would now tell people pretty that please don't do that. (laughs) But I, I got that to that point because I was uneducated and I was, I had lots of education, but I was uneducated on this subject. And um, I was 
kind of leading out of this, um, you know, traumatized, grief stricken part of myself that was still trying to parent a child that was no longer a child. And I was doing that ineffectively because I wasn't educated on substance use disorder. So um, while I was going through this, I decided that if I ever got to the other side of this, I was going to make myself the person that I needed when I was going through this. So, and because I was a teacher, I'm all about education. So I started even then to read everything, to connect with people. And it wasn't enough to connect with, you know, to, to just connect with just anybody. I had to connect with the people that created the programs, the people that, um, you know, that, that were at the core of the research. And I, I just could not stop learning enough. It was the only thing I felt like I could do. And even though I was doing that, it still took a long time before I finally really got it. And I always tell people the name of the book is If You Love Me, because one night she had come home after, um, you know, using and, uh, and, and back and forth and in and out. And she had been to about at this point, about 35 different entries into treatment. And um, I had done about 35,000 crazy, crazy things in order to try to help her. And um, I thought I got it, you know, and she came home one night after having about the longest she had ever had, I think it was about four or five months of sobriety, came home, had been living with, um, I'm sorry, she would have been living in a sober house after treatment with these great people, disappeared one night and uh, they couldn't find her. So they went out and they looked for her and they looked everywhere for her. And about three o'clock in the morning, she came home, she, they brought her home and she was sitting on my kitchen floor and um, dirty and crying and sad and so, so disappointed in how things were turning out. And because she had had a lot of hope that this was it. And um, I looked at her and I said, Katie, I, lo I love you so much and you're going to die. And she looked back up at me and said, if you love me, you'd let me die. And that's when I started to get it. And that's when I started to realize that my lack of like getting it was really getting in the way of her getting well. And I am not a cut them off, you know, don't help kind of person. But I realized then that there were lots of things that I could do. And I'm slowly realizing it. Lots of things that I could do that were um, that were helpful and lots of things that I had been doing that weren't helpful to anybody. So um, and I had been going to to meetings, you know, to, to a bunch of meetings. I was tr always trying out a different meeting and um I realized then that the meetings that I was going to, while they might have been helpful 20 or 30 years ago to get the word out that you weren't alone, we have 100,000 people overdosing and dying. And for every person that, 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 that overdoses and passes, there's between one and five people whose lives are completely blown up. And I'm not making that up. Those are actually, that's the evidence, the science behind it. Um, so if you have... If you think of the Rose Bowl Stadium, which is what I always show, and then you have five more stadiums full of people whose lives are forever changed for the worse because they've now lost this person that they love so much. We know we're not alone. I mean, I mean, if you still think you're alone after that, you're not watching the news. So I don't think there's too many people out there that know that don't that feel like they're the only ones. But there's a lot of people out there that are still not educated. So that's been my, you know, between the, I do one-on-one -on -one family coaching between the family coaching and um, the uh, family meetings. My hope is to get people educated, supported and connect and connected to other people that are also educated and, and not passing around bad information or marinating in the trauma and then also teaching people effective ways to take care of themselves. That self-care piece is so important. My self-care, I always tell people, was eating a pint of ice cream. That was not helpful. It's a dopamine spike, and it created um, about 20 pounds around my middle. That's all that really did. <laughs> so that's kind of how I got here. 
So thank you for that. And, um, you know, for those who have not read the book, um, I, I strongly suggest that you do. In fact, you know, I, I shared the first time we had you on, I read it in, in two days, you know, like I, I would read it on the treadmill because I, I couldn't put it down, but I also couldn't not get my steps in. So I just combined the two, um, you know, and it really impacted me, you know, as a, as a mom, but also, you know, doing this as my life's work. But I also wanted to share, I just, I just supported a, a mom this past weekend getting her child into treatment. Um, and um, I talked about our family meeting, which I want to talk a lot about today, um, and how that how that evolved and kind of what we're what we're doing now. And of course, encouraged her to attend that and let her know that this came from you know from your work if she's familiar with it. And she had read your book and she read it in one day. Yeah. Um, and um, she said, I'm not even a reader. This is not a thing that I do. And it, it had such a huge impact on me. Um, and she was also a great example of someone who um, knows the, the field, at least peripherally, and when, when you're faced with having to do it for your own child. So it was very different, right? Like it was like, totally well, now what? what do I actually do? If I hit a roadblock, what do I do next? And what is the right way to do this? And, you know, and this is the same. I was hoping that treatment providers would read this book. People that are involved in this that don't think, please, God, never may you never have to go through this. But that they would read the book. So, because you think you understand what the family's going through because you're working with the family, but this hopefully draws you in so deeply that you feel like you're in the middle of it. And that's what, because I've, I've, I write, typically my writing style is fiction and this is a memoir, but um, so the memoir reads kind of like fiction. Unfortunately it's not, but that's what I was hoping that people would just get so pulled into it that they would, even if they had never had any experience with it, they're like, oh my goodness, this is what people go through. It's and eye opening. It, yeah, yeah, it did that for me. I mean, I think I, I'm not, you know, kidding when I say it kind of changed both my own personal clinical practice, right? Which then has the ripple effect. Of, of course, at Spectrum. And so I want to kind of talk about what that, that what that turned into, right, for us. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I love the most about this podcast is, of course, sharing, just like the goal of your family meetings is to share, you know, information, real information about what is, is true and, and real and evidence-based, right? And then also sharing, you know, the, the connection and recovery stories, like having those things kind of together is one of the goals of this podcast. And, um, but it also has built such wonderful connections. Um, and that is one of the things that I think we all need more of, right? We're all um, connected to this. And if we can work together, we can really make a bigger impact. And so what we, what we did shortly after having you on the podcast is I just reached out and said, hey, can we can we talk about your family meetings and what that might look like? And, um, and that turned into you providing a training to, you know, 10 of our staff, um, most of which, Jesse included, um, you know, have um, been still connected to this family meeting. And we have been running a Magnolia, um, you know, fast meeting for about eight eight months now, weekly, without a break. Um, and so uh, talk about kind of that that ripple effect, um, you know, over over time. And so I just, you know. I would say it's a wave by now, not just a small ripple, but we're talking big <laughs> waves. waves. Yeah. That's good to hear. That's really good to hear. That's what I was hoping for, that, you know, people could go someplace where they could trust the information that they get wasn't just opinion. It wasn't just uh, pain. It was actual, you know, there's, there's somebody in there that would say, ah, that's not necessarily true. It's science and evidence has shown that, that this is what this, this is what the actual truth is so that, you know, that people are not walking out of a meeting feeling worse than they walked in. They're actually getting facts and they, things that they can trust from people that they can trust. I wanted to go back to something you said in the beginning, Maureen, about that genetic predisposition you talked about about how you, you quote, did everything right. And, and you had some active family and you moved away from them and the family vacations and the dinners. And, but, but that genetic predisposition still caused your loved one to fall in love with the drug from the very first time. And I think that's just so important. You know, currently I'm in a master's program and I'm in a advanced principles of lifespan development. And we talked about the nature versus nurture debate and the facts are that the science right now shows both and. So it's nature and it's nurture together. There, there's no, you know, 
one or the other. And, and that's just so important for families that like you just said, you know, you could easily, I, I think the term you used was marinate in the trauma yeah. and try to figure out what you did wrong. Well, you did, you know, in that case, the best you could with what you had. And then you, you still had to deal with this because we're, we're dealing with something so much bigger than d- just our interpersonal relationships. We're dealing with, you know, genetics at its core. Right. And I mean, we can do lots of things to make that gene. Uh, Gabor, I always butcher his name, Gabor Mete, yeah. who wrote in the realm of the ugly, in the realm of the hungry ghost, um, talked, I, I attended a, a, um, a training with him and he talked about how that, you know, you may have that predisposition to be the person that um, you know, maybe feels things more d- deeply that doesn't react maybe with that heart out of shell that maybe I might react with, but so you may be that person. There needs to be something in, in the work in your life that tips that off, right? Whether it's an introduction to early introduction to drugs through maybe no fault of the families, you know, it just happens or some traumatic event that just happens. And for some people, it could be uh, seeing the family pet get hit by a dog and other people could have trauma un- upon trauma and they don't, they don't try drugs, but there's got to be the combination of the two. And it's not always somebody's fault. Sometimes it's just life. You know, I think fault kind of, we want to find fault so that we can assign blame and then we can assign blame that we can make ourselves different than the next person. And then it won't happen to us. Unfortunately, that's not how it works. And that's what I like so much. That's what I love so much about Magnolia and your program is, you know, you could have done that and found the blame and, you know, spent all that time and energy and motivation and, you know, whose fault is this? And and instead you chose, let's, let's get educated. Let's go right to the source. You know, I, I wrote down that book in the realm of the hungry ghost, cause I'm excited to, to read that and, it's and a learn fabulous about it. Book. Yeah. It's really a great and book. As every other resource that you've given me in our, our trainings. And, you know, I went back and listened to the first podcast you were on before I was involved with this and just the, you know, there's a, there's a line that in, you know, cause I'm in recovery and in personal recovery, uh, we talk about, we have two choices. We can make moves or make excuses. Hmm. And I, I would say that you definitely made some moves. Maureen, hmm. and, the, and, and, you know, here we are talking about the fruit of that, you know, yeah. all these years. And there's no, you know, there's no guarantee. I just know that when I walked into meetings and people told me, you know what you have to do. And I can't even count how many times I've heard this. You have to cut her off. And you have to just completely not talk to her, not have anything to do with her and tell her to come back in three months when she's sober. And that was so ridiculous to me. I mean, I just couldn't even, I I couldn't even wrap my head around why somebody would say that much less do it. So I knew that there had to be another way of doing, of supporting somebody and and loving somebody, but also um, having boundaries and protecting myself because, and I say myself because the boundaries are about me. That you can't make boundaries for somebody else because you don't have no control over somebody else, right? But I had control over me or I should have had control over me. And when I started to get control over myself is when I started to feel better and I start started to be able to be that rock. And that's what I'm hoping for with these meetings is that people will realize through, um, through education, being supported by other educated people, and by um, taking care of themselves, that they can get control over themselves. And then you, they can be that rock that everybody needs, right? And we would encourage people to do that if it were any other disease. And I modeled a lot of what I did after programs that are in Children's Hospital and, and Dana-Farber. And, and this is what they do. They educate the families and they gather around them. And they sh- they don't say, you know what, you kind of cut them off until they, you know, until they're um, until they start getting better. And if they don't want to participate in their treatment, just don't talk to them for three months. Who would say that? <laughs> yeah. That brings me to kind of one of the things that you said don't mind my puppy going nuts, um, about you wanted to make yourself the person that you needed when you were going through this, you know, and it has a lot of parallels to what often individuals in recovery have, right, that, that they go into the the field so that they can be that person that, you know, that they needed when they were going through it. And we're doing that from the family perspective, right. And I think that that's just so, so needed. 
Um, I really appreciate that. Well, there's such a temptation. And I know that, you know, like, and I understand it completely to just say, oh, God, okay, that was really bad. I'm done. I don't even want to talk about this anymore. But I'm but there wasn't a lot of people doing what I'm doing. So in 2012, when we started, when I started Magnolia New Beginnings, I do the we thing sometimes when I feel like it's too much, <laughs> I make myself two people. So I started this nonprofit and um, our, our goal was, our financial mission was to raise money for sober living. And um, for people who had no, no, and we worked a ton with Spectrum. Spectrum and the Ferris Center was probably the place where we gave the most amount of um, of sober living scholarships, especially at that time, Ferris was long term. I don't I, and and you know and so there was like, and then people would go into sober living from there, and it was probably uh, the the best working relationship that I had with the treatment center, and the, um, it was for people who really had no uh, they had no one they had no family they had and I started to see the difference. When I got behind somebody and I could say, you know what, I'm, I'm going to stick with you and I'm not going anywhere. And that alone, because they were, their families had been told you got to cut them off. So when we did that, and then they went into sober living and I stayed in touch with them and I would say like a recovery coach, and this is kind of almost pre recovery coach before it got, you know, big, I saw the difference in people. And um, so that financial mission was huge. And then the other part was to connect family members to information and to each other. And that was done through our uh, support groups online. And we have over 25,000 people in these in these groups now. And then part three has been to build these family meetings, these curriculum driven family meetings that um, that educate support and um, and and create a practice of self-care. I, I think that's just so, um, I mean, you couldn't write it a better way. You led with taking care of the practical need because I, I talk to people about this family group. Obviously, you know, I, I work in the lane of family engagement here at, at NERC at New England Recovery Center, but, you know, I talk to clients all the time and, and they kind of look at me sideways, like, what are you doing? But then when I mentioned, oh, Magdalene, New Beginnings, you know, they gave a lot of money to sober housing, probably nine out of 10 clients know, oh yeah, I've heard of them. Or, oh yeah, you know, they helped me out of this or whatever. So it, yeah. it's, you, you led with the the practical need, let's take care of, you know, the, you know, the, the next logical step um, it, to, to build that, you know, I, I don't think you said the word, but when you, you talked about like, I'm not going anywhere, I immediately thought of trust. Yeah. And, and I know, it's going, you know, I remember when I came through the program here and it, at first it, it seems like everyone, you know, you're just so used to an angle and, you know, someone's doing something for you. What do they want? Right. Yeah, what there was no, from- there was no nobody was getting paid. There was no salaries. There was nothing. There was just a labor of love. And um, and because my daughter, you know, fortunately, we were able to help her with sober living. But I saw people coming out not and having nowhere to go. And it's gotten so much better because there's a lot of organizations doing this now. Unfortunately, Magnolia is no longer doing it because the, the since COVID, we've been like the, the donations have been down. But there are other organizations doing it where I think only Heron Project was doing it when I was doing it or a cup, maybe one or two other places. So I, I, I'm glad it caught on because it's, it's important work. I mean, that's, I have a, I have a grandfather who used to say, um, don't come to me with a problem unless you have it, unless you have a solution. It doesn't have to be the right solution, but you better, you better be thinking about what you can do about something. Otherwise it's just whining and no one likes a whiner. <laughs> and it's true, right? <laughs> Very true. And I think that's another great um, example of the work that you've done is to create something that will hopefully grow. And I think that, do you want to talk a little bit about the the family meetings? You know, now that, that Spectrum's running them, you're doing other trainings, kind of, yeah. you know, you started doing them and creating the curriculum and running the meetings, but now that mission's shifting a bit to, to spread that, right? So that others are doing that and it becomes just the way that we support families. I think that, we, you know, when I first started Magnolia, I wanted to connect people all over the country and let them be like a union, right? It was like a family union where we could demand things, where we could inform each other. And people are like, 
okay. And it really, it really did happen. And then uh, my goal was to make it so that Mass Health and other other insurance companies paid for the beginning of those that first month of sober living as an extension of services. I have a feeling that may happen or is starting to happen. And um, but now my next goal is to create these family meetings so that um, we change the way we do family meetings and the family meetings for um, and, you know, it's a two day training that a community group, a treatment center um, uh, goes through. They train their um, staff that's going to be facilitating. So where even but even in community groups, we have a lot of people that are recovery coaches. They understand the basics of of addiction at least, right? And um, so we're training these people in how to conduct the family meetings. And the first day is a lot of craft and which is um, kind of a, um, um, an intervention modality for lack of a better way to say it. Invitation to change, invitation to change the subtitle. The book is called Beyond Addiction that I always tell people to read. And I use it when I teach the family systems class in the community colleges where I teach family systems. Beyond Addictions, the subtitle is How Science and Kindness Help People Change. And that says it all, right? So the, the, the training in the, in the first day is more about how to work with families, how to, how to do the meeting. And the second day is practical stuff on how the meetings are actually run. But they're curriculum-driven meetings. So the curriculum will be the first 10 or 15 minutes, 15 minutes, depending on the subject, is... Um, information about something that a parent needs to know but wouldn't need wouldn't know how to wouldn't know that they needed to ask right and i always use the example of post acute withdrawal syndrome when i talk about post acute withdrawal syndrome to parents they're like what but after we get done talking about it for 15 minutes they're like oh my god i've seen that i just didn't know what it was i didn't know it was normal i didn't know how that i could expect it to go away i i i didn't understand it while i was looking at it i only wish i knew then what i know now and i hate that because that hurts my heart when i hear that and then the second part of the meeting is a lightly facilitated family meeting where people can connect and talk to each other and open with crosstalk. But um, if somebody says something that's clearly untrue, there's somebody in there that understands addiction that can say, actually, that's not true. Or actually, science has shown that this is actually, this is the, this is the truth of the matter. So that we're not spreading false information so that we're not letting people marinate in the trauma and just just vent and vent and vent without a solution because that's not helpful and we want to vent a little bit but we want to be solution based right like my grandfather said <laughs> and then at the at the end we want to teach people self-care skills and i always explain the self-care to, to people like when you're looking at that mountain in May and you're looking up without a trail, without a path, and you say, I'm going to get to the top of the mountain eventually, and you keep going and going. And by the end of the summer, the mountain has has a clear path. You can go up in 15 minutes. That's the same thing we have to do with self-care. It's, it's a muscle. We have to build that ability to calm ourselves because if ever there were people that needed to be calm, it's family members that are supporting somebody with a substance use disorder. We have to be logical and reasonable in a completely illogical and unreasonable time in our lives. So, and it's the self-care. I mean, it's, there's science behind this, like everything I say, there's science behind the fact that people who practice have a self-care routine are their brains change. And that's what we want. We want people to be able to deal with this and look back and say, oh, think I knew things that I didn't think I'd know. And I was taking care of myself in a way I didn't know what I needed to do. And that's why I was able to deal with whatever comes along because we don't know what's going to happen. And it could be, you know, I tell my story of my daughter walking into over 40 different treatment, 40 different entries into treatment, spending years um, homeless and, um, and it was, you know, overdosing to the point of death 13 times, probably another 20 that, um, that she was revived by somebody who had Narcan and she's got five years of sobriety now. So, awesome. and, and definitely I owe the fact that I'm still here through that with the fact that I educated myself, I surrounded myself with people that were not telling me bad, giving me bad information. And I, I tr st 
towards the end started to really understand the importance of self-care. And I think that's another parallel, right? We teach our patients, our clients, right, in treatment, these kinds of self-care activities, right? Things that are as simple as, you know, mindfulness, right, and, and meditation so that we can kind of create that calm, create that space before you make a decision, right? But we we don't always teach families and they need it sometimes more, right, in order. Kind of never teach more. families. Honestly, I mean, I want all those treatment centers, really good treatment centers because we had great insurance. And um I got three, maybe four family meetings. And they were all around discharge planning. No one was trying to help me. No one was trying to educate me. No one found the importance of that. You know, I, so, I think it's often Maureen in my role here as the family engagement specialist. And you know, I know I've, I've shared this with both you and Lisa before. I didn't go into this to educate families and help families. I, I went into this, like we said earlier in this podcast, to be that person that I wish that I had. And I did have here at Spectrum a few different people that I modeled my career after to help the people that came after me get through active addiction and into early recovery. And this family role was, for lack of a better term, dropped on my lap. And I took it and I ran with it. And then when I met you, and, and, and so that, that just became the norm here. You know, this is what we do. We've always had a family engagement specialist and then I became one and now we're reaching out to families and including them in treatment. And then when I met you and, and you said what you just said now, you know, 40 treatment centers, a handful of calls, usually around, you know, the aftercare plan, that just made me realize how, how much more we need this because there's, there's so many families that need to be engaged with and educated that aren't right now. Right. I mean, this is like a little, uh, like a weekly mini IOP for families, <laughs> you know, it's because it really is modeled after that, right? That's what we do when someone's in, in, in a PHP or an IOP or in treatment, we, we teach them and we help them take care of themselves and we let them connect with other people. Right. So that's what fam, that's what families need too. That's what everybody needs. And they need it over the long term, right? So what I love about it is it's not tied to a treatment episode. Right? right. Of course, we share this information and we I, we want to have the families of our own patients join this family meeting. Right. Because we know that if families are supported and families have what they need, that actually our clients will do better. Right. And their recovery. So, of course, we want that. But it's open to absolutely anybody, you know, locally, nationally. Um, you know, and we've had we had folks from multiple states on with Jesse. Jesse facilitated last week. Um, and it could be at any point. Right. It could be while your loved one is in active treatment. It could be when they're in long-term recovery. It could be when they have a return to use. And, and you know, when, when you're kind of supporting them across their own long-term recovery path, families need that support across their own long-term recovery path as a loved one. And we as family members owe this to our loved ones too, right? To be educated and to understand and, and to not let our emotions get away from us, which is what I did for a very long time. But um, we owe this to, to the people that, that we love because we're asking them to change their life completely and then change it forever. But so I think that it's a really just a, a very small ask is that we also become educated and, and, and learn what, what's best, what's the best way to, to live in this new family, you know, because that's what it is. That's a great point, Maureen. And the way that I put it to families, I have the pleasure of working with is whether you know it or not, the whole family's in recovery now. Oh. It, it looks different obviously from the person in, you know, early recovery to the family members supporting them, but you know, how many times do we see families that, that, you know, you talk about blame, put all the blame on the person, you know, in active addiction and, and I'm, I'm not going to change. Right. And, and be becoming educated and realizing, well, what, you know, there's, there's actually a benefit to the whole family system changing because the family system was broken in the first place to get here. So if we want our loved one to, you know, get through active addiction and into early recovery, well, there's a lot of steps that the whole family can take as a unit to ensure that, you know, getting on the right path. Right. I mean, when I started to take care of myself, she saw the shift in me. And when I work with other young people, as I did, as I, you know, continued to do, and um, 
I tell them, you know what, I am going to do this with you as many times as you need to do it. I hope that you, this is it because I don't want to lose you and because I know how dangerous this is. Um, but I'm not going anywhere. And when I started to have more of that attitude, you know, and less of the, oh, my God, you're killing us. What are you doing to us kind of attitude? She started to get well. And I mean, in the truth, the real truth was I would have done that with her as many times as it needed. And I did. But um, definitely, you know, that feeling of I'm here for you. I know you're suffering. I know you're struggling. And as bad as I feel, I'm, you know, I'm sure that I can't even begin to comprehend how how bad you're feeling. It was just very different, you know. It was very different to come from an educated point of view and to understand um, to understand the disease, the disorder. And so I guess one of the things I want to also add to that is that we have to continue to educate ourselves, right, and change. And I think this is a great example for, for me, for Spectrum, for the Recovery Center of, you know, evolving and changing with new information, right? And, and being, you know, open and available to what new information might come, right? And, and, and I'm actually really hopeful that, you know, as a field that we, you know, we evolve further and that we go back to really involving families as a, as a, as a, a you know, substance use disorder as an addiction field, right? Because we used to do this. I love know? that you're saying that. Yes. Yeah. Back in the, you know, probably predates me to be fair, but you know, back in the eighties, it was, it was commonly agreed upon that addiction is a family disease and that, you know, everybody needs to work together. And then it shifted over time to a, a real focus on just the you know, identified patient. I wonder why. Yeah. Do I know why? Because insurance doesn't want to cover it. That's why. But you know what? The, you, it, it's not keeping you from doing this, right? It, so, so that needs to be a lesson to other treatment play, to other treatment providers that yes, you can still do this, even if, even if it's, um, you know, just if it's a family meeting once a week, you can do something. So you may not have a family engagement specialist. You may not put your focus on like spe like Spectrum does and really trying to help. But everybody can everybody can do something that I think that you can spare an hour out of um, that may not be covered by treatment. I went to um, I was speaking at the um, at um, the the West Coast Symposium and there was a great awesome. Um, a PhD a doctor named um, Mike Barnes, and he was speaking about this. And somebody got up from a treatment center, a very well-known treatment center that bills out huge amounts of money. And he says, how do you afford to do this? Because he was talking about their family program, the need for a family program, Mike Barnes, Dr. Barnes. And um, he goes, and this other guy said, I guess I don't know how you afford to do that. That's not, not covered by insurance. And Mike Barnes says, how can you afford not to do that? I was like, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Maybe if we do it, then we can create that system change so that it can be reimbursed. Just like your dream of that, you know, that, that sober living time being covered right. by Medicaid. Like maybe this could become, I mean, because family therapy is, but this isn't you know, family therapy, right? This right. is support, but it's that- edu Yeah, education, work. right, absolutely. And um, I know that there's treatment centers out there that do some of that, the bigger, like the really expensive treatment centers that uh, there's a lot of those that, that, you know, that like Turnbridge and places like that, that have that family weekend built in or they used to anyhow, pre-COVID. Um, but um, you don't see a lot of, you know, uh, treatment centers, especially- treatment centers that also provide lots of services for the communities doing something like Spectrum is doing. And I'm really, really proud to be affiliated with you all again. <laughs> and we'll continue because we plan to run another training, build capacity, be able to continue to do this for the long term, right? Maybe even expand upon it. Well, uh, wouldn't it be great to do it in person again? I know these are all online, which is great because on a Wednesday evening at six o'clock Eastern time, people can come in and they can tune in from all over the country and they do, and they can come to the meeting and they can share because it's the same, uh, the same pain in California as it is in New York. So, and you know, Ohio, there's no difference between that, but when you're, um, it, it would be nice to have meetings again in person where you could sit next to somebody and, 
I know one of the most meaningful moments when I was, I was actually at a meeting and um, a friend of, who wasn't a friend then, somebody I just met, put her arm around me. And I'm just, you know, it was just like, oh, my God, I was just so heartbroken and to have somebody do that. So it would be nice to have it, even though this is great, but it will be nice when we can sit together again. Yeah, I, Maureen, agree. I, I can't wait for that. Yeah, me too. One of the things that I experienced here through, you know, before COVID, COVID, uh, yeah, I feel like we have two different times, pre-COVID and, and now, now, but pre-COVID, we had our, our family engagement uh, weekend, our family renewal program, where on Sundays, the families of our current clients would come up and they would meet with of myself or <laughs> family engagement specialists. And we would do an hour long seminar where there would be similar to your program. We would have psychoeducational piece and we would have time for discussion and Q and A. And then they would meet with their loved ones for, uh, from two to four in the afternoon in our cafeteria right here. And one of the things I quickly deduced, and I, I must've talked to my clinical supervisor, Annie back then about this, like incessantly, she was probably so sick of hearing it. I'm like, can we do something for the whole community? Like, this is great. We're taking care of our clients, but can we like, you know, do something uh, just open to anybody? And, um, you know, I, I, I talked about it so much and, and we even had like a, a plan sort of, you know, the physical space to figure out how to do it and, and you know, all the uh, operational side of it. Uh, and then COVID happened. So I, I am very excited to be a part of Magnolia Fast Family Groups. And I look forward to the time because it will happen. Yeah, oh, it, it's, it's right around the corner, I think. And you know what I like about the family meetings, too, is that you're getting an opportunity to connect, you're getting an opportunity for that self-care. But those 15 minutes of education was about all I could handle. You know what I mean? Because I was so traumatized and so wound up all the time. And I needed them every week. You know, I, I mean, I can look back and think. Oh, God, I wish I had had that, you know, that just check in with here's some new information. Here's take the resources. Here's the resources if you want more information on that. But, um, you know, I just could take it in little bites. So I, I like that the model for me, that's what would have worked because I, I wasn't really capable of doing anything for any length of time. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Well, I want to kind of wrap us up by just kind of reminding our our listeners, those that might be watching on live now, um, that we we are running a weekly support group on Wednesday nights at 6 p.m. If folks are interested in getting the links to that meeting, um, you can be added to our email list and get an automatic response with the, the Zoom link by emailing uh, magnolia at spectrumhealthsystems.org. Um, and we will put that in the, the notes, um, you know, in the comments today and in the notes, um, you know, for the, the podcast as this kind of gets put out into the podcast airways. Um, but that's all you need to know, right? We'll send you back the information. And we really hope that, that we have more families joining us uh, because the more uh, families join, and you can probably add to this, the, the more meaningful that meeting is, right? The better that discussion is um, and the more lives that we're you know, positively um, impacting. So I wanna make sure we get that, that email out there, magnolia at spectrumhealthsystems.org. And I, and I really wanna thank you for coming back, Maureen, for staying so connected um, to us since that first first podcast airing and the training. And now we're moving into kind of an, another training to continue to add capacity and, yeah. and being a real partner and being very giving of yourself and your knowledge and your time um, to, to really impact, you know, our work. So thank you. Well, thank you for all you do. We're all kind of in this together. You know, it's going to take a lot of people working together to, to make a dent in, in what's going on. Yeah. And, and giving that knowledge and time, we, we do ask all our guests about a, a podcast or a book or a resource or something that, you know, uh, you're currently engaged in that's, that's helping you. So I pose that same question to you. I mean, you've given us half a dozen different resources already, but what comes to mind that you're, um, you're currently engaged in as far as resources? Um, I'm doing a lot of work right now with researchers out of the University of Texas Tech. If anybody wants to um, look into that, their names are Bradshaw and Shumway. Um, there's, um, they wrote a book called To Achieve Lasting Recovery, but they're also doing a lot of work on um, 
on, on the family and uh, functional MRI testing on the brains of family. And they're just about to release some research on how we become uh, impacted by um, going through this. So I think that's, you know, that my big interest right now is I like, I want, I like to see it, you know, the evidence and the science behind things. And that's a great example we talked about earlier, right? Continuing to learn and grow. And as new science comes out and kind of learning and understanding that and letting it kind of inform how we, how we share and support families. They're going to be doing research on the uh, curriculum as well. And, um, and Duke is also interested in doing research on the curriculum. So I'm excited about that because this needs to be evidence, evidence-based. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Well, well, thank you so much, Maureen, for- Thank you. Really, this is just a, a shining example of what happens when people are, are persistent and motivated and driven and educated and bringing people together like you you have yourself. So thank you very much for, thank you. for joining us yet again. And, and who knows, after the next training, what fruit that's going to bear. And, you know, we'll have you come back on and we'll, we'll talk about the next version of this. It sounds awesome. All right. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody. See you, See you next time.